I received this message yesterday, or it came in yesterday. Good morning on the first work day of the new year. Determined to make each day count for the ministry and as a soldier on the battlefield. First thing each day. 2017 is going to be a great, God willing, and the creek, the creek don't rise. I have a first fruits mindset which is not possible this new year, but I want that angel that goes before me. I always ask for that every morning. And I never go down the stairs to my apartment without repeating a request that I do not fall when I'm out and about even with the first fruits, without the first fruits being paid. Do you teach on first fruits and did I miss it? I haven't mentioned it much because I don't teach tithing. I don't teach first fruits. I teach treasure giving based out of Matthew 6. I teach hilarious giving based out of the Corinthian letters. Treasure giving, not reluctant, reluctant treasure giving, but hilarious treasure giving. You can't wait with a passion to give. And that passion is only going to be there because I also teach unworthy attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. I don't know if there's one available on the website or not in the fruit of the Spirit category. I teach on Agathosuni, one of the attributes of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And what is that? Generous giving. Liberal giving. The same writer that the Corinthians wrote also the Galatian letter, Paul. To the Corinthians, it was hilarious giving. To the Galatians, it was an attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, which was generous giving. And above all, Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 6, lay, not up, treasures, or lay up treasures for yourself, where? In heaven. Treasure giving. That will sort you out. And I've also taught on the attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. We all want to see our attributes, whether it's faith, love, whatever, that's part of the attribute list, to grow. And I drew a chart. You want, if, you're on, if, you're progressing your, if you're charting your progression, you start down here and you keep climbing, climbing, climbing growth. But when it comes to Agathosuni, an attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, generous giving, it flatlines. People don't want to grow in that area. You have the Spirit of God in you. Whether you can give anything or not, the desire is there to, to give. You might be flat broke. You don't have a penny to your name. That doesn't change one iota of that burning desire to at least say, when I get something, I'm giving it. Because I want to lay treasures up in heaven. Where I know Christ has promised rewards for doing it. Because it says, lay up treasures for yourself. And why that yourself? I've taught on this in the Where's Your Heart series, in the Giving series that's on the website. It's also, I believe, the, yeah, there is. It's in print also, in Where's Your Heart, Volume 1 and 2, I think there's two volumes, in the written format of those messages that I preached. We lay, lay up treasures out of obedience to our Lord, Christ Jesus, that command us. It's not a suggestion there, by the way, and I've covered that before in Matthew 6. It's a command. And you won't even 
feel like it's a command because if the Spirit of God's in you, the burning desire is there to give. Period. And that's how you know that attribute is alive and well and growing in you to more and more a completed man as far as much as we can be completed down here. The more you give, the more the Lord has the opportunity to reward you for that giving. And those are the principles that I teach on. The rest of the church world teaches on a tithe principle. And most people on the average give around 2 to 3% tithe if you average out all the tithes that come in. I believe because teaching with that principle draws a stalemate conclusion in your growth in giving. Now, this particular HOF is asking about supposedly the angel that's promised if you give your first fruits. Now, in Exodus 23, if you're not there, go there. Exodus 23, starting with verse 14, it reads, Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month, Abib, for in it thou camest out of from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. And the feast of the harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. The first of the first fruits of the land, thy land, shall bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. Behold, I send an angel. So that word angel before thee to keep thee in thy way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke broke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy enemies and an adversary unto th thine adversaries. For my angel shall go before thee and bring thee into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and all the Ites, and I will cut them off. Now, you hear a lot of prophecy, I mean the prophecy, prosperity gospel preachers preaching now, send in your first fruits. So you have this angel go before you. Well, let's back it up a little bit. Assuming it's an angel, which I don't believe it is, and I'll tell you the reasons why here in a minute. But assuming it's an angel for now, the only way this angel is promised if you are participating in three times, as it says in verse 14, in the feast that happen out happen throughout the year. In verse 15 it says, Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread, and thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee. So what does that mean? If you don't eat unleavened bread for seven days, you're not going to have this supposedly angel that goes before thee? Because it's part of the whole equation, my friend. It's part of the instructions here. You just can't pick and choose which of the verses you like from 14 to 19. You've got to keep all of it. Now, it might not make any sense to you in today's day and age. 
Why should I eat unleavened bread? And of course, they spiritualize and rationalize that in a New Testament, unleavened bread means something totally different. Well, you still have to keep that something totally different, which I'm not going to waste my time getting into tonight. They still have this angel that goes before you. Think about it. And is it an angel? It's not that clear in the Hebrew. I don't care who you are. And I've had you, when I've mentioned this before many, many years ago, most scholars think just a representative is mentioned there, not an angel. The ch early church fathers of the early church, from 100 to about 300 A.D., Justin Mater and others got into angel worshiping, my friends. And when the Catholics came around, it just took off to another level. Throughout the Old Testament, angels, when they do legitimately appear, do not want you to bow down to them. Never. Because they're God's representatives to serve us the way God accordingly wants them to in the scriptures. They're never to be bowed down to or worshipped or prayed to. That's heathenism. Before I sent a representative is a better translation. And we have a clear picture who this representative is. This is a pre-incarnated Christ. And how do we know that? Because if you read on in verse 21, beware of him. In the Hebrew, it's, if you're going to use everyday language today and translate it, be attentive to him when he arrives and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. When did angels ever in the scriptures, if you are certain it's an angel, then prove to me where in the scriptures that angels was ever or ever had the ability or the consent from God to pardon our transgressions. Show me that. Show me that. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary <coughs> for thy adversaries. For my, not angel, but representative, shall go before thee and bring thee into the Amorites, the Hittites, and so forth. Now, in my Bible, I have a footnote, and actually, one that I could agree with. It happens once in a while. It reads, concerning verses 20 to 23, and I'll read it to you. There is strong evidence that the appearance of the angel of the Lord are, in fact, a pre-incarnated appearance of Christ. the Son of God. <clears throat> Things are said of the angel of the Lord that go beyond the category of angels, and that's what I just said, and are applicable only to Christ. Hagar called him by the name of God in Genesis 16, 13. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses from within the burning bush, the text of chapter 23, it is said, of the angel of the Lord, he has power to forgive sins. Oh, I, I, I skipped a sentence here. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses from within the burning bush, the text of the scripture, the angel himself, and Moses all affirmed that the angel is God. Exodus 3, verses 2 through 6. <clears throat> here in Exodus, the verses I just read to you, chapter 23, it is said of the angel of the Lord that he has the power to forgive sins 
and that he has the name of God in him. No man could see God and live, but the Son of God, who is the fullest that God had bodily, body, has declared him. I totally agree with this conclusion. Just in that one line that I focused on, who has the power to forgive sins and transgressions? Who? No angel. It's speaking of a pre-incarnated Christ here. Get off this angel bandwagon. I know many preach it. That's an angel of the Lord. I'm sorry. If you're going to preach that there's an angel of the Lord that goes before you if you keep the first roots, let's just not just talk about the first, first roots. Let's also back it up to the Feast of the Level and Bread. You have to keep that for seven days. And when was the last time any of you even thought about eating unleavened bread for seven days? So you get the angel of the Lord before you. Keep things in context. And keep things, which I call the verifiable words of, word of God, as a principle. You can't find anywhere in the scriptures that angels are able to pardon transgressions. It's not their responsibility. And they don't have the capacity to do it. They're a creator of the Godhead, but they're not the Godhead. Just like we don't have the power or the capacity to forgive everyone's sins if they believe, pray, bow down to us and confess to us that we are a son of God. We don't have that ability. It's not been granted to us, my friend. It comes from the Godhead. And what, speaking, what this scriptures are speaking of is a pre-incarnated Christ. And I'm so tired of people talking about first fruits and tithes. I really haven't gone into the history of the early church and how the tithe thing starts circulating again. And it became an established system to force the congregations to give a certain amount minimum. And of course, it put a stalemate on giving once again, especially the way I teach it. Oh, you mean I don't have to tithe? I don't have to give anything at all? Have you heard anything that I just said? If that's your attitude, you don't have the Spirit of God in you. If desire is not there to give, you don't have the Spirit of God in you. Because it's one of the attributes of the fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit provides to allow you to grow in the Spirit. If you haven't heard that message, go. I, I recommend it after this program or tomorrow, the next day, next week. Listen to that message in Agatha Sunni on the fruit of the Spirit to better get a under, better understanding what I'm referring to. Now, did I bring it? Yes, it's right here. Just to show you how people just start rallying off things and not have a full understanding. This is a small sample, which I'm going to read to you, and trying to understand the Old Testament way of giving and the legalistic system it was that does not apply in our day. You don't see the apostles in their letters to the churches saying, you better tithe. You got to tithe this. You got to tithe that. They would be on the tithe. And I've said many times, you think you're going to turn on God? You think you're going to oppress God? If you do less than the Old Testament saints? If you have an attitude that, well, we don't have to do it, it's not instructed. Once again, it just demonstrates you don't have the Spirit of God in you. At least that attribute. 
And there's no re reason why you wouldn't have that attribute. Because God was a giver. He gave what? His only begotten Son. The ultimate gift. I know that kind of roused some of your cages out there because you've been so stingy and determined that since I said there's no tithing, that you don't have to give anything. Oh, you're dead wrong, my friend. I teach on treasure giving, I teach on Agassuni giving, and I teach on hilarious giving. When you combine all that together, it goes beyond anything the Old Testament required from saints that willingly or unwillingly were participating in. Let me just read. I'm not going to read all of this, but this is put together by a Jewish historian. This, the subject is far more complex, complex than a simple 10%. And would usually have amounted to more under Old Testament law. The basic idea of the tithe, the 10%, was bound up in the first fruit offering of the land. Two of these first fruit offerings were public and national. The first omer on the second day of the Passover and the wave, lo wave loaves at Pentecost, Old New Testament. The other two kinds of first fruits, or reshit, the first, the beginning, were offered on the part of each family and of every individual who had, possessed, had possessions in Israel, according to the divine directions in the book of Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and so forth where the ceremonial to be observed in the sanctuary is also described. Authorities distinguish between the bikurim, or first fruits offered on their nat natural state, and the teramuth, brought not as raw products, but in a prepared state, as flour, oil, wine, etc. The distinction is convenient, but not strictly correct since the teramuth also included vegetables and garden produce. However, these first fruits and their offerings were complex and the traditional regulations were largely based on being actually from the Holy Land itself. They must be the produce of the Holy Land itself in which, according to tradition, were included in the ancient territories of Og and Sion, as well as that part of Syria when David had conquered that territory. On the other hand, both the tithes and the teramuth were also obligatory on Jews in Egypt, Babylon, Ammon, and Moab. The bacurium were only presented in the temple and belonged to the priesthood, their officially at the time, while the teramuth might be given to any priest in any part of the land. The Mishnah now holds that as according to Deuteronomy 8.8, only the following seven were to be regarded as the produce of the Holy Land from the, them alone, the Bacurium, were due, such as wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and dates. If the distance of the offer from Jerusalem was too great, the figs and grapes might be brought in in a dry state. <laughs> of course, neither tithes nor Bacurium nor Termaruth were to be given of what already belonged to the Lord, nor of what was not fairly not fairly the property of a person. Thus, if only the you, the tree, excuse me, but not the land in which they grew, belonged to man, he would not give first fruits. Talk about getting confusing, huh? It's amazing. Now you can understand, everybody knows that Jews are good bookkeepers. Jews are really tight with their money and they keep a good account, accounting system with their money. They've had a long period of time where they had to practice so much legalism and how to take care of their financial responsibilities that have made them what they are today, if you really think about it. In the end, when all the requirements were considered, it's hot in here, the actual amount to be given was more than just the tithe, and it would have been around 25% of the overall revenue of the community from the harvest that God calls to be enjoyed. 
Thus, the prescribed religious contributions of every Jewish layman at the time of the Second Temple were as followed. The Kurim and the Termuth say 2%. From the first of the fleece, at least five shekels. Wait. From the first of the dough, say 4%. Corners of the field for the poor, say 2%. The first Levitical tithe, 10%. The second or festival tithe to be used at the, at the feast in Jerusalem. And in the third and sixth years to the poorest tithe, which is about 10%. The first leaves of all animals, either in kind or money value, five shekels for every firstborn son, provided he were the first child of his mother, and free of blemish. <laughs> you would have blemish expectors, I guess. And the half shekel of the temple tribute. Together, these amounts are certainly more than the fourth of the return which the agricultural population would have. And it is remarkable that the law seems to regard Israel as intended to be the only an agricultural people, no contribution being provided from, for, from trade or merchandise. Besides these prescribed, there were, of course, all manner of voluntary offerings, pious works, and all, above all, various sacrifices which each, according to his circumstances or piety, would bring to the temple of Jerusalem. It is very clear that the Mosaic law did not apply to all income and assume an agricultural society, clearly that dating some aspects of God's purpose for the Mosaic law. And it's remarkable that the law seemed to regard Israel as intended to be the only agricultural people, no contribution being provided from trade or merchandise. When we look to the New Testament, we can't draw real parallels from the Old. For the intention to support, for the intention was there to support a government as well as the church. In a sense, this means that under Old Testament, once taxes and church offers were paid, 75% of most people's income was left. Of this, people could still make free will offerings. As the original society under Moses in the desert would not have necessarily had any courtesy, most payments for other services were probably made with produce from the land, meats, etc. Although in some cases, cereal may have been used. Is there, it is therefore somewhat natural that a translation of the Old Testament of paying a generic 10% for the tithe on all that one's earned is understandable, though not really argue, arguable directly from Scripture. Date where this was first established within the Christian community under Catholicism was around 567 AD. The payment of tithes was adopted from the old law and early writers speak of it as a divine ordinance and obligation of conscience. The earliest possible legislation on the subject seems to be contained in a letter of the bishops assembled at Tours in 567 and the canons of the Council of Macon in 585. In course of time we find the payment of tithes made obligatory by ecclesiastical enactments in all the countries of Christodom. As the church grew out of Jewish culture, tithing is simply a carryover from the Old Testament law. I don't need to read anymore. I did get the idea. Giving was complicated in the Old Testament. And you have to be very precise. You couldn't shortchange if you wanted this pre-incarnated Christ to go before you, not an angel. That all changed when we get to the New Testament. A different standard was laid down. You didn't have to sacrifice animals. You didn't have to turn in your farming surplus or percentages you don't have to do any of that you had to give of yourself you had to give because of the desire you have in you now to give and the instruction is very clear well I'm not too sure about that because you're not a really a hilarious giver you're not a generous giver you're not a treasure principle giver you want a system that keeps you on that flat line, never growing attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. 
your bare minimum, which in the average, most people don't even keep. Now, do I need to participate in first fruits? No. Christ is our gift now. Christ fulfilled all the Old Testament requirements of the law, Mosaic law. And there's a new standard. And there's the promise. You trust and you faith in him. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Turn on the air conditioner. He will never leave you or forsake you. And it's not dependent upon an exact amount of what I should give. But this does not excuse you from not giving anything. I have told you. There's principles in the New Testament of why you should participate in giving. Out of obedience to Jesus Christ and his command. Like I said, not a suggestion. But what about Malachi? I'm so tired of that being thrown at me too. Malachi. Now you could apply it as an individual to yourself if you want to do that. But who do you think Malachi was referring to? Because the verses, obviously in ver chapter 3, verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. How many times you've heard that? Who was Malachi referring to? Well, you go back to Malachi chapter 1. You have him, the burden of the Lord, of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And it goes on through chapter 1. But something changes. Let's just look at it briefly. In chapter 2, the conversation changes to the priest, the corrupted priest of Malachi's day. The corrupted priests. Let's keep all these scriptures in context. And it sounds like the way most preachers preach this, that the nation of Israel decided to stop giving. And they were robbing God. I'm sure there were some that were like that. But it makes it sound like the whole nation was guilty of it. But that's not who Malachi was referring to. You look at chapter 2. Now let's keep all this in context. Verse 1. And now, O you priests. Who's he speaking to? Oh, and now, O, o ye priests. This commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to your heart to give glory to the name, say the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yeah, I have cursed them already, because ye did, not, ye did not lay it to heart. And it goes on. O ye priests. Malachi is referring to the priests. He's directing his message now, after getting through chapter 1, lead up, concerning the nation of Israel. Then he gets to really specific, and he's talking to the priests. And he keeps talking. Verse 7, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge. <coughs> but verse 8, talking about the covenant of Levi and how it's departed. You continue in chapter 2, still talking to the priest in the beginning of verse 14. What does it say? Yet ye say, these are the priests responding back of what they would say to Malachi's scolding. Yet ye say, still, ref still referring to the priests. Verse 17, ye have worried the Lord, who? The priests, with your words. Yet ye say, priest still talking here, wherein have ye wearied him? Continue. 
Does the conversation change? No, because you'll still see the same references of who he's referring to throughout these verses as we lead up to Malachi 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. Corrupt priests have robbed them. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? And of course, in tithes and offerings. Verse 13, chapter 3. Still referring to the priests. Your words have been stout against me, said the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? This is a back and forth dialogue. Whether the priests were saying it or not, Malachi is saying, This is what you're going to say, and this is the response to it. So, what were these corrupted priests doing? They were stealing the tithes that people were giving and not putting them in the storehouse. God knows what they were doing with it. That's the context of what's going on here in this letter. But preachers have used this and hammered people. You have robbed God. Now, I'm not saying there's not people that do rob God. In the New Testament, how are you robbing God? By not laying up your treasures in heaven? And you're robbing Jesus Christ the opportunity to give you eternal rewards. I strongly recommend, if you haven't, you need to listen to Where Is Your Heart Giving series. Or read it. If you're already listening to the other series, read the Where Is Your Heart Giving series. I've let it out what New Testament giving is all about. It's not about tithing. It's about the things that I've laid down briefly here. Treasure giving, hilarious giving, generous giving. All it requires one thing, that the Spirit of God is in you and you have a strong desire to participate. God's a giver and He's giving us that attribute. You'll either resist that attribute or you'll take it and say, I want to be like Jesus. I can't lay down my life and save anyone by the spilling of my blood. But I sure can forward the message. I sure can participate in ministries and churches that get the message out. In the meantime, you're fulfilling a command by Christ himself. Matthew 6, and I'll finish there. Such a familiar passage. This is where the giving series begins. Lay not up for, your, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. This is what Jesus is saying. This is not my words. Lay not treasures up for yourself and upon earth, where moth and rust do it corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, it sounds like that I'm being selfish in my giving. I'm giving so I can get treasures. Well, you take that up with Christ if you don't like the way he worded it. But that's what exactly he did because he knows that by you doing that, it benefits you and allows him to reward you. Something he's desiring to do that will carry through eternity that are inexhaustible rewards. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor, moth nor rust do corrupt and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. Heart, I told you, is cardia in the Greek. It's the center and seat of your spiritual life.
stop putting all these attachments to the giving. Well, if I give, I get an angel of the Lord. You're giving for a reason that's not ever used in the New Testament. Because the New Testament is not under the law anymore or what it had to do in the old. Why would you? Now, can God, he's the creator of all beings, can God use angels? Whether to protect you, whether to guide you, by whispering in your ear, or whatever kind of reason you want to come up with, God can do anything he wants. I'm not limiting God. But he's made very clear that the only thing we need in the New Testament, and the Old too, by the way, in the New Testament is him. Him alone. You don't have to claim a promise as you're going throughout your life that God sends forth this angel to go before you. Why would you want second best, if that, when you have the best? Let me put this in very simple terms. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that goes before you. I don't want no angel. I want Jesus. Now, if he decide to send his angels to do some unseen thing that I came in that, that that I don't even know what's going on, that's his business. I'm not against it. But I'm not claiming a promise for it either. There's only one promise I can claim. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. However he wants to go about fulfilling that promise, that's his business, not mine. I'm just claiming the promise. Period. And the prosperity gospel preachers are now just preaching this and, and preaching this and exhausting this to the point where people are so excited because they can get an angel in front of them. I repeat, what would you rather have? Christ? The Holy Spirit or an angel that goes before you? I know what I want. I want him. Him only. And I'll let him administer how he accomplished that. And that's his business to use any part of his creation to do his bidding to get it done. Period. Now, I went all over the book, God's Word, to try to get to an understanding of stop worrying about this scripture in the Old Testament, which you cannot even keep. And I know how they've justified, well, if you give your first paycheck or you do this and this. Well, fine, do that. It makes you eat a leavened bread for seven days also. And by the way, that's not the only requirement. If you're going to claim that Old Testament promise, that word to Israel, as they were going in the land, the land that was promised. That became part of the Mosaic Law. The choice is yours, my friend. Give me Jesus. I have nothing against angels, but give me Jesus. I'll let him administer his angels the way he sees fit. But my words, my God's word says, I only have to seek him and him only. And that's what I intend to do, and that's what I intend to preach. I preach, I repeat, treasure giving, hilarious giving, and generous giving. And if you have a true desire to give, even if you're flat broke, I repeat, the desire is still there. And then when you do have something to give, there's nothing that's going to hold you back, my friend. I get amused at these people that give an average of 2 to 3% tithes. They're really thinking, like I repeat, impressing God. When back in the Old Testament, it was 25% minimum, plus the offerings. 
how we twisted and made void the word of God. Well, if I clear that up for you, let me know. If you're still stuck with that Old Testament principle, well, hopefully you could come out of the tunnel that you're in and open yourself wide open to the truth of God's Word that's laid out in the New Testament and how we should approach our view on giving that's declared in His Word. You got it? I'll play a song I want to hear from you.